Since Bull and Barwark and the others made so much of the various scarcity exceptions to the cost principle, we will examine the treatment of such exceptions in the writings of the classical political economists and the socialists themselves. If, as we shall see below, the classicals freely admitted such exceptions, it follows that the marginalists and the subjectivists were tagging a straw man, or at the very least that they had a far different idea of the level of generality necessary for a theory of value. Although Adam Smith figured much less prom prominently than Ricardo in subjectivist attacks on the labor and cost theories of value, he still did not entirely escape their attention, so it will be worthwhile to examine statements in his writings of exceptions to the cost principle. Smith treated the fluctuation of price above and below its natural level, not as violations of his idea of natural price, but as the mechanism by which it was sustained. The market price of every particular commodity is regulated by the proportion between the quantity which is actually brought to market and the demand of those who are willing to pay the natural price of the commodity, or the whole value of rent, labor, and profit which must be paid in order to bring it thither. Such people may be called the effectual demanders and their demand the effectual demand, since it may be sufficient to effectuate the bringing of the commodity to market, it is different from the absolute demand. A very poor man may be said in some sense to have a demand for a couch and six, but his demand is not an effectual demand as the commodity can never be brought to market in order to satisfy it. The quantity of every commodity brought to market naturally suits itself to the effectual demand. It is the interest of all those who employ their land, labor, or stock in bringing any commodity to market, that the quantity, quantity never should exceed the effectual demand, and it is the interest of all other people that it never should fall short of that demand. If at any time it exceeds the effectual demand, some of the component parts of the, its price must be paid below their natural rate. If it is rent, the interest of landlords will immediately prompt them to withdraw a part of their land, and if it is wage or profit, the interest of the laborers in one case and their employers in the other will prompt them to withdraw a part of their labor or stock from this employment. The quantity brought to market will soon be no more than sufficient to supply the effectual demand. All the different parts of its price will rise to their natural rate, and the whole uh, to its natural price. If, on the contrary, the quantity brought to market should at any time fall short of the effectual demand, some of the component parts of its price must rise above the natural rate, and as a result, factors will enter the market until the quantity brought thither will soon be sufficient to supply the effectual demand. All the different parts of its price will soon sink to their natural rate, and the whole price to its natural price. The natural price, therefore, is, as it were, the central price, to which the prices of all commodities are continually gravitating. Smith, in this analysis, outshone the Austrians on two points. First, he admitted supply as a dynamic factor rather than treating the balance of supply and demand at any given time outside any larger context. And second, rather than treating demand as absolute and therefore virtually unlimited compared to supply, he considered only effectual demand for a good at its natural price. Attention to these two points demand uh, goes a long way to avoiding the misleading impression of utility theory of value as badly stated by the Austrians. In the same chapter, Smith, a made a detailed study of the various forms of inelasticity, natural or man-made, which cause price to deviate from cost in the short or long run. Among these, he included trade secrets, site advantages of soil, and state-granted monopolies. The correspondence of actual or nat natural price over time was a function of the elasticity of supply. Depending on this variable, pr pr variable prices might approximate costs more or less quickly, or never, 
Like Ricardo, Smith limited the operation of the cost principle to those cases in which the supply of a good could be increased to meet demand. These different sorts of rude produce may be divided into three classes. The first comprehends those which it is scarce in power of human industry to multiply at all. The second, those which it can multiply in proportion to the demand. The third, those in which the efficiency of industry is either limited or uncertain. In the progress of wealth and improvement, the real price of the first may rise to any degree of extravagance and seems not to be limited by any certain, ba certain boundary. That of the second, though it may rise greatly, has however a certain boundary beyond which it cannot well pass for any considerable time together. That of the third, though it, its natural tendency is to rise in progress of improvement, yet in the same degree improvement it may sometimes happen even to fall sometimes to continue the same and sometimes to rise more or less according as different accidents render the effort of human industry more or less successful the first category included those goods which natural only produces in certain quantities as for ricardo he made it clear at the outset that his labor theory of exchange value applied only to those commodities whose supply could be increased in response to demand. Like the other classical political economists and Marx, he also made utility a criterion uh, for exchange value, thus dispensing with favorite mud pie, red herring of subjectivists. Possessing utility, commodity derived their exchange value from two sources, from their scarcity and from the quantity of labor required to obtain them. There are some commodities the value of which is determined by their scarcity alone. No labor can increase the quantity of such goods and therefore their value cannot be lowered by any an increase in supply. Some rare statues and pr pictures, scarce books and coins, wines of a peculiar quality which can be made only from grapes grown on a particular soil of which there is a very limited quanti quantity or all of this description. Their value is wholly independent of the quality of labor originally necessary to produce them and varies with varying wealth and inclinations of those who are desirous of to possess them. These commodities, however, however, form a very small part of the mass of commodities daily exchanged in the market. By far, the greatest part of those goods which are the objects of desire are produced by labor, and they may be multiplied, almost without any assignable limit. If we are disposed to bestow the labor necessary to obtain them, in speaking then of commodity of their exchangeable value and the laws which regulate their relative prices, we mean always such commodities only as can be increased in quantity by exertion of human industry and on the production of which competition operates without restraint. In this passage, Ricardo dealt with goods whose supply is totally inelastic, as exceptions in which exchange value is determined by scarcity rather than labor. He also mentioned free competition as a requirement for the law of value to operate. These are the two major exceptions listed by Bohm and Barwick as the damning flaws in Ricardo's system. Du duly noted by Ricardo and seemingly no 